you could draw some very similar parallels to Nazism and uh, Italian fascism and other forms of fascism. And that, so within the Jewish community, uh, internationally in Europe and the US and uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, uh, the Jewish community had actually been quite active in the communist and socialist movement and involved in labor organizing and class struggle. And the Zionist movement, if you think about it, it's a class collaborationist ideology of should all come together as Jews and forget if you're a Jewish capitalist or a Jewish uh, worker or a Jewish peasant. Uh, you should all come together because you're Jews and you're under threat from this. Uh, everyone is out to kill you and you need this, uh, this safe haven in Palestine, uh, so-called Israel, uh, to be safe and you should forget about class struggle in your own country, leave and go to occupied Palestine and everything will be fine. But I guess I should start off with um, fascism in Europe going at it uh, chronologically. So I think a key aspect of fascism, in my view of it, is that it's basically an attempt to create a fake populism to serve the establishment. Um, uh, but that, that's very, that's sort of very vague. I mean, there's a lot of things that could fit that, uh, that isn't necessarily fascism. But I think a key aspect of it is the concept of class collaborationism. So in every example of fascism that we've seen from Italian fascism to Nazism to phalangism in Spain or uh, the various uh, other smaller fascist movements like the Iron Guard in Romania, there is always uh, within it uh, the concept of class collaborationism. And this, I think, is very important because fascism often tries to portray itself as a um, anti-establishment force and even in a lot of cases a socialist or quasi-socialist force but the fact that it advocates for class collaborationism I think is a perfect example of how it is not and it's in fact in the service of the ruling class. I'll start out with uh, Germany and how uh, Nazism sort of developed there um, prior to the Nazi party actually forming, there was the sort of the pre-Nazi formations, you could say, were uh, the Freikorps, which was uh, sort of a grouping of former uh, World War I German uh, soldiers, uh, veterans who came back from the war and were far right in orientation. These were, uh, at the time it was mostly monarchist and nationalist led, and they were actually utilized by the social democrats of the Weimar Republic to fight against the communists in the, uh, I believe it was the Bavarian uh, Socialist uh, Republic. And so this is actually an example of how liberalism opened the door to fascism and how liberalism, the social democrats, rather than allow for an actual socialist revolution, which was going on in Germany, they allied with these far-right reactionary forces to destroy the possibility of socialism. And they used these Freikorps to kill uh, people like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and uh, basically killed the... Um, socialist revolution in Germany, utilizing these far-right uh, reactionary forces. And this goes completely against the liberal narrative and uh, Trotskyist narrative of what happened in Germany, because the liberal narrative and the Trotskyist narrative tries to blame the quote-unquote Stalinists for not allying with the social democrats. But I think this shows perfectly well that in fact it was the social democrats that aligned with the fascists or the proto-fascists uh, to prevent uh, the rise of socialism in Germany. And so I think the Freikorps is a very good example to start out with, with uh, the foundations of Nazism in Germany. Um, because all of the, basically all of the Nazis, the top Nazis were in the Freikorps prior to the uh, Nazi party 
before not before they were Nazis, they were Freikorps basically because Nazism really didn't exist yet. And so you had the uh, the SA or the brown shirts who were the uh, at the forefront of the Nazi movement, and they claimed to be national socialist, quote unquote. And you sort of had a quote unquote left of that, which came to be known as the Strasserites and uh, who were uh, the sort of ideological leaders of them were the Strasser brothers. And I'm sort of zooming ahead, skimming over a lot of this history. Uh, but when the Nazis eventually came to power, they actually purged this section of the party of these sort of true believers who actually were naive enough to believe that the Nazis who their whole career basically was oriented in fighting against communism and socialism and organized labor. Somehow these Nazis uh, were actually socialists themselves, um, according to these, the, the Strasserists. So these were like the true believers who actually thought that Nazism was going to have some uh, working class orientation. Well, they were all killed in the, light of, the Night of the Long Knives. And uh, I think that showed that Nazism was completely in the service of the ruling class and how this idea of quote unquote national socialism was actually just uh, a cover. And it was to establish a fake populism and to try and hijack the credibility of the term socialism and to try and hijack any naive sections of the working class that they could. And from the beginning, anti-communism, anti-Sovietism was a key aspect, if probably the key aspect, in fact, of Nazism. While claiming to be national socialist, at the same time, they're always 100% anti-communist and anti-Soviet. And that was from the very beginning, from Hitler's Mein Kampf, all the way up until them coming to power and Operation Barbarossa and the invasion of the Soviet Union. So that was the intention, actually, to establish a form of uh, fake populism, uh, demagoguery, pretending to be against the bankers, uh, pretending to be against uh, the elites, while in fact serving the elites and trying to prepare the public for war with the actual threat to the elites, the actual threat to the bankers, which was the communists and eventually the Soviet Union. Um, when I say eventually, I mean because eventually that their whole uh, orientation and their whole uh, everything they were doing led to the war with the Soviet Union. And so I think that's a very uh, important way of looking at the Nazis. And it's complete. it completely destroys the whole liberal narrative of Nazism because they try to maybe they'll mention the anti-communism, but they want to sort of separate that and not make that the main aspect of it when in fact that was a central aspect of it and serving the uh, German industrialists, the German ruling class, that was the key aspect of Nazism and these few, um, the dumbest idiots, the, the Strasserists who actually believed that they were going to actually go after the capitalists, <laughs> they were all killed by their fellow Nazis. So, um, and you could find quotes from Hitler, despite claiming to be a socialist, national socialist, that false term. He was always talking about what socialism meant was just to be patriotic and to serve Germany. And the whole thing about, quote unquote, Jewish bankers, it's not the issue that they are bankers or capitalists. It was an issue that they were Jewish. So it's completely, um, it's, it's complete nonsense to try and distract the public from the actual issue and to say that, oh, well, uh, capitalism is fine so long as they're patriotic German capitalists. We just need to get rid of these Jewish capitalists. So it was always in the service of um, the ruling class of Germany, perhaps targeting a small section of the ruling class who were Jewish, but serving the overall German ruling class. And of course, uh, it was class collaborationist because of that whole concept of uh, it being okay for there to be capitalism so long as it was uh, German capitalism. And that 
we're all German, so we should all uh, forget about this concept of class struggle. And of course, the Nazis claim that class struggle and communism was a Jewish conspiracy. So um, it was it was all an attempt to try and prevent socialist, actual socialist working class revolution and to get the working class to be subservient to the ruling class and march into war in the service of the uh, German military industrial complex to march into war with uh, the Soviet Union. Um, which of course was a complete failure. Uh, they were destroyed, um, but nonetheless, that's what they were thinking. They would. Uh, that's what they were planning. Now, moving to um, Italian fascism, which the Nazis actually were heavily influenced by. Um, within, similarly, the backbone of the fascist movement in Italy was made up of uh, the uh, World War One veterans uh, who formed uh, the Black Shirts and uh, became led by uh, Benito Mussolini, who was a former socialist, um, but had renounced, uh, basically had renounced socialism uh, because uh, he felt that um, Italian socialists should support uh, Italy in World War I, uh, going against the concept of internationalism. And coming out of there, he was, uh, after World War I, he was uh, basically a, a nationalist um, in the hire of uh, the ruling class. And actually, British intelligence, in fact, uh, documents have come out showing that British intelligence was actually funding him as well. And so with the Black Shirts, uh, they began um, after World War I and, you know, the Great Depression, the economic crisis, the communists were organizing similar to in Germany. And the black shirts were utilized by the ruling class to attack the communists, attack the socialists, attack organized labor. And what was uh, one of the what was one of the key uniting ideological principles of fascism? It was this concept of uh, corporativism, sometimes uh, translated as uh, corporatism, which sort of gets confused. A lot of people. Um, take this quote from Mussolini and actually kind of take it out of context, not to what it actually means. And it sort of gives people a misunderstanding of fascism. It sort of cheapens it. Um, this quote from Mussolini where he says, fascism is the merger of state and corporate power. And when people hear that and repeat that, they sort of think of that in the modern context of corporations and private companies. But that actually isn't what he was talking about. Uh, corporativism is class uh, collaborationism, the idea that there would be state uh, bodies that would take the employer and the employee and they would basically engage in class collaborationism um, guided by the state. So the idea being that the state would take the workers and the capitalists and guide them together for the, for, for the service of the state. So it's actually not the merger of corporations and the state, because in capitalism, that's always the case. The state and corporations are always working together. So when people take that quote and misunderstand it, it actually cheapens it because then all capitalism could be defined as fascism because there's always the merger of state and private, uh, private capitals. That's always been the case. Um, so corporativism or uh, class collaborationism, that was really from the economic standpoint, the, uh, the key aspect of fascism and how it completely differs from socialism or communism. And uh, so under this guise of uh, patriotism, uh, we all need to, similar to Germany, Germ uh, Italian workers and Italian capitalists need to come together for the service of the nation. And these communists who are trying to carry out class struggle, it's some foreign conspiracy to sabotage the country. That's what they were uh, saying. And uh, eventually the king of Italy uh, basically handed over the reins of power to Mussolini to rule the country. And uh, similarly, from the beginning, anti-communism was a key aspect of it. And like in Germany, the whole point of it was to create something new, some kind of strange quasi-revolutionary ideology to compete with communism uh, to serve the ruling class because communism had such an appeal with German working class and the Italian working class. The ruling class realized that they needed some kind of distraction, some way of 
causing an ideological confusion and creating basically um, a vanguard for them under this false ideological guise of like this uh, fake populism, fake revolutionary appeals um, to get the public uh, to back, uh, um, like in Germany, German imperialism um, and the war with the Soviet Union and the other countries in lead up to that. Um, it was to get the Italian public and the working class to stop class struggle and to support the state and its imperialism in Libya and Ethiopia and in the Balkans and eventually also in the invasion of the Soviet Union because Italy also very idiotically sent troops to fight along Hitler in the invasion of uh, the Soviet Union. And I think this, in my opinion, uh, the combination of class collaborationism and fake revolutionary appeals. I think that's a key aspect of fascism and how you could differentiate it um, from other uh, other ideologies. Because this is, this was throughout Europe, the fascist movements, whether it be the Phalangists in Spain, the Iron Guard in uh, Romania, the Nazis, uh, Italian fascism, they all use this class, they all claim to be against the bankers and they would frame it as Jewish bankers. Uh, but advocating for class collaborationism and against class struggle. And I think that was a really a defining aspect of it, this combination of uh, fake revolutionary appeals and class uh, collaborationism uh, in the service of this uh, fake, uh, or yeah, I guess you could just say nationalism, uh, fake or, or actual nationalism, however you want to define it. So I think those are some key aspects of it. Now... Um, to go into Zionism, you could draw some very similar parallels to Nazism and uh, Italian fascism and other forms of fascism. And that, so within the Jewish community, uh, internationally in Europe and the US and uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, uh, the Jewish community had actually been quite active in the communist and socialist movement and involved in labor organizing and class struggle. And the Zionist movement, if you think about it, it's a class collaborationist ideology of they're all Jews and they should all come together as Jews and forget if you're a Jewish capitalist or a Jewish uh, worker or a Jewish peasant. Uh, you should all come together because you're Jews and you're under threat from this. Uh, everyone is out to kill you and you need this, uh, this safe haven in Palestine uh, so-called Israel uh, to be safe and you should forget about class struggle in your own country, leave and go to occupied Palestine and everything will be fine. And I think two groups that are perfect examples of this within the, the foundations of uh, Zionism before the creation of the state of Israel were these two Jew uh, Jewish Zionist uh, terrorist groups, the Lehi and the Ergun, which were far right Zionist uh, paramilitary terrorist groups in occupied Palestine and they actually advocated for alliances with the fascist powers, the Axis, uh, European Axis and I think that is a very, um, it shows the hypocrisy of Zionism because Zionism likes to call everyone anti-Semitic and uh, Nazis and such when in fact they are willing to work with the most anti-Semitic people to further their cause. And of course, many other Zionists, early Zionists, uh, I believe within the revisionist Zionism school, they had this idea that they would promote anti-Semitism because it would further their cause because they wanted to get the Jews out of Europe and elsewhere. So having a hostile environment was in their favor to, to do that. So um, from the very beginning, actually Zionism, because a lot of times, within like more liberal criticism of Zionism, there's this idea that Israel is historically a democracy. This is what they, they say like around the world. They like to use this concept of like, uh, uh, what, do, what do they say? Uh, democratic uh, regression, uh, re receding democracy and encroaching authoritarianism. They like to portray Israel in that context of saying like, oh, Israel is historically a great democracy and it's just Netanyahu and these right-wing extremists who are destroying it. They like to say this about a lot of countries around the world, and they like to lump in Israel, uh, so-called Israel, in this. 
Um, but in reality, from the very beginning, Zionism, from even before Israel ex existed as a state, up until all of its history, Zionism was an extremist, racist ideology. And these terrorist organizations, the Lehi and the Irgun, were some of the founding fathers of Israel, and they're celebrated as uh, the founding fathers of Israel, along with the other Zionist uh, terror groups, militias. Um, and they were, they were absolutely uh, supremacist ideologies. They carried out massacres against Palestinian Arabs. Um, and uh, from the foundations of Israel, they uh, carried out horrendous massacres against the indigenous Arab Palestinian population. Um, so speeding ahead to around the time of the creation of the state of Israel, um, they carried out uh, one of the most famous massacres was the Deir Yassin massacre, which I think is very important to emphasize because there's this narrative, imperialist Zionist narrative that Oh, the, the Arabs just attacked Israel and uh, it was the Arabs' fault and the Israelis are just always defending themselves. Well, before any Arab army self def in self-defense attacked Israel, the Deir Yassin massacre took place, which is where Zionist uh, terrorist groups massacred uh, Palestinian civilians. Um, and there were similar such massacres going on throughout Palestine because from the very beginning, for there to establish a so-called state of Israel, they had to, similar to any settler colonial project, similar to in the U.S. with the massacre of the indigenous people of North America, um, they uh, create carrying out genocide and ethnic cleansing was a necessity from the beginning. They you can't establish a so-called Jewish state on an Arab land when. <laughs> the population there are all Arabs. They So from the very beginning, they were carrying out genocide against the Palestinians. And uh, from the Darius Yassin massacre all the way up until what we see going on in Gaza today, there were loads of uh, these sorts of massacres carried out in different ways. Now it's a high, it's a high tech uh, genocide going on where they use the most sophisticated uh, bombs and weaponry provided to them from the US. But this line of genocide has been going on from the very beginning. And so tying Zionism back to fascism and not Nazism, I think uh, a common thread is that um, there's the racial uh, extremism, um, the genocidal intent, but also the, the class nature of it. It's an attempt to um, get rid of the class struggle disguise the class contradictions within, in the case of Germany, uh, the Germans, in the case of Italy, the Italians, in the case of Zionism and the Jews, it's disguising the class contradictions within the Jewish population and trying to lump all Jews together and in the service of imperialism uh, because Zionism is a tool of U.S. imperialism and British and European imperialism and we see that very much today with why the U.S. fully backs Israel, uh, despite it being making the U.S. look obviously horrible around the world. It's it's done because it's in the service of U.S. imperialism. It prevents Arab unity because Palestine, occupied Palestine, so-called Israel is right in the heart of the Arab world. So it's basically it's a dagger to cut the Arab world and keep the Arab world divided. And Israel attacks all of its neighbors. Previously, it attacked Egypt constantly. It attacks Syria to this day constantly. It attacks Lebanon constantly. It's attacked Iraq constantly during the Iran-Iraq war, of course. Israel bombed Iraq um, and was supporting Iran against Iraq and bombed the uh, Iraqi uh, nuclear facility in Osirak. So Israel is very much in the service of U.S. imperialism. And I think that's a key thread within fascism, Nazism, Zionism is that it's this, uh, it's this ideological uh, tool used to rally support within the uh, community to, uh, to serve imperialism and the ruling class.